We saw what God has already done for us through Christ. We saw what is ours, what has already been provided, and what is rightfully ours because of what Jesus Christ has done. The Bible says he has positioned us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we saw that, you know, we can utilize our rights and we, how we can walk at, the, at least a little bit, how we can walk in the right of the benefits of what Christ has done for us in this year, in this season. And particularly we said this, that what belongs to you, what belongs to you will become a reality in your life, you know, it what becomes a reality, what becomes what a reality or what you possess of what belongs to you it depends on what you do. You know, what becomes a reality in your life of all Christ has done and provided becomes it depends on what you do in 2005 or 2015. 2005. God have mercy. Uh, Ten years ago, amen. Some people were probably now, nah, who knows where you were in 2005. God has brought you a mighty long way. Amen. Amen. And one important thing that we also established or emphasized was how you call it is how it will be. Amen. How you call it is how it will be. You know, so God has given us a lot. God has already provided the lifting, the structure that is needed to lift you to where you need to be. Amen. Amen. But today we want to go a little bit further. We want to begin to look at what you need to do to fulfill, uh, what you need to fulfill or to do to experience God's lifting in your life this year. What do I need to do for God to promote me? We are still looking at those that subject of divine lifting. But what do I need to do for God to lift, lift me up, to lift me to where I need to be? So our theme today is separation leads to promotion. Say it with me. Separation leads to promotion. Separation leads to promotion. Say it one more time. Separation. Separation leads to promotion. Leads to promotion. Okay. So let's go to Acts chapter 13. And I'll be reading from verse 1 through 3. And then I'll go back to the Old Testament and read from Daniel chapter 1. Acts chapter 13 from verse 1 through 3. So you're talking about separation. We're talking about what we need to do. What we need to do to experience the lifting that God plans for us. Now in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Amen. Amen. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. I'm going to be reading from verse 1. For context, I'm going to read almost everything in that chapter. So that we can be very familiar with the story. Sometimes we assume that we know, or you know, what these things say, and really it couldn't be further from the truth. That's what I found out. So it's good to read. So I'm going to read about 20 verses. Amen. Amen. Okay. In the third year of the reign of Joachim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Joachim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Avinas, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans or the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision for the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that in, at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shedrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. 
And the chief of the eunuch said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then, then you endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies, and, you, and as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away the portion of delicacies and the wine they, that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Amen. Amen. Verse 17, as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams now at the end of the days when the king had said that they should be brought in the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar then the king interviewed them and among them all none was found like Daniel Hananiah Mishael and Azariah therefore they served before the king and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Separation leads to promotion. May the Lord bless his word Amen. and prosper and expound it into our hearts in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Separation leads to promotion. What is divine lifting? What do we mean when we're talking about divine lifting or divine promotion? What it means is becoming exceptional. It means becoming way above every or becoming more than average. You're not average, you're exceptional. One of the things I've been praying for myself this year is that the Lord will make me exceptional. I choose not to be average. I read a book years ago that about, um, I think the title was The Enemy Called Average. The average is an enemy. Average is an enemy to the believer. I choose to be exceptional in every area of my life. I will not be average. I'm tired of being average. Is there somebody like that in the house? I don't want to be average. When God lifts you up, He makes you exceptional. When God promotes you, He makes you better than everyone around you. God lifts you up and causes His glory to, to shine upon you. Being lifted above your peers being lifted above your colleagues or even superiors. That's what divine lifting is about. What does it mean? What is divine lifting? It's a turnaround of fortunes. Someone who's been struggling and making it struggling hard to live. God turns the situation around. You're barely living to get him paid by day by day, living from paycheck to paycheck. When God lifts you up, He takes you from that realm and He takes you to where you have more than enough. So when we're talking about a year of divine lifting, we're talking about a turnaround of fortunes, a turnaround of destiny. When we're talking about a year of divine lifting or a season of divine lifting, when God lifts up a person, what does it mean? It means the release of the abundance of divine grace and favor upon the person, uncommon favor, favor that is not ordinary. God released favor upon Daniel, upon his peers. When God lifts up a person, he releases favor that is unusual. And I declare for someone today that in this year, the Lord will release favor upon you. Amen. God will give you uncommon favor. Amen. The Lord will lift you up. Amen. When God lifts you up, he gives you great abundance of grace. He gives you great grace. He gives you great favor. When God lifts you up, you begin to occupy your place in destiny. That means what you were created for, what God designed you to be, you begin to fulfill it. I pray for someone here, you will begin to fulfill your destiny. In this year, you will fulfill God's purpose for your life. When God lifts you up, you receive a unique gift. A gift from God that sets you apart. A gifting from God that makes you different. The Bible says that God gave this for young men. Knowledge and skill and understanding in all literature and wisdom and culture of the Babylonian Empire. 
Remember, they were not born in Babylon. They had three years of study, and they were better at the end of these three years than those who had studied and known these things all their lives. But that is not all. The Bible says, if you read verse 17 of that chapter that we read, that God gave Daniel a unique gift, a gift of understanding dreams and translating visions. The Lord will give you the gift that will set you apart. Sometimes what you need, the difference between where you are and where you need to be is just a unique favor, a unique gift from God. It's just something from God, an option, a release from God that makes you different, that sets you apart. I want to be different. I want to anywhere I get to, I want, I want to rise to the top. I never want to get to a place and just, I, I know I'm, I'm a shy person normally. For some people that's strange. I'm a shy person. I don't say anything. But you know, when I get anywhere, I want God to take me from the bottom and take me to the top. And I know that's what God has done in my life and I'm expecting him to do much more. Yeah. And the Lord will do so for you in the same in the name of Jesus. Sometimes it takes a gift. Your gift will make room for you. Yeah. So when we're talking about divine lifting, we're talking about a gift, a unique gift from God. What gift do you deserve from the Lord? A few things to pay attention to in our text. I hope later on I have more time to talk about Acts chapter 13. If I don't today, we'll talk about it next week as the Lord helps us. But looking at Daniel chapter 1, there are quite a number of things I want you to pay attention to. You know, sometimes, one of them is this, sometimes... God's children suffer, not because of what they cost, not because of what they did, but because of other people around them. Where was Daniel? He was in Babylon. God was already judging, was judging the nation of Judah, was judging the nation of Israel. He took them into captivity because they sinned against him. But amongst these people, though the nation went into captivity, yet amongst them there were people who had a heart for God. That's why it's important for you to pray for the people around you. Because sometimes, if you are not paying attention to the people around you, your family members and the people you live, your neighbors, the people in your community, they can create a havoc that will destroy your own life or make life difficult for you. That's why don't be selfish as you pray for yourself. If you're praying that God will bless you, you need to be praying for your neighbors. You need to be praying for those around you because, you know, God says, you know, when there's peace in the land, we will know peace. Are you with me? So you see, sometimes things happen that we don't, we didn't cause it. But one of the things that I've realized is what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. No matter what happens, God always remains faithful. God will always make a way of escape for his children. No matter what happens, even if it's caused by you or caused by someone, as long as you come to God, he will always make a way of escape. And I trust that he will do so for you in the name of Jesus Christ. And then something else that I want you to pay attention to before we come to our point for today is that the king had a good intention. Nebuchadnezzar had a good intention. His intention, of course, not, not, I'm not talking about the intention of taking the nation of Israel captive, but his intention towards the young men. He wanted to use those ones who are good. You know, he wanted to give them an opportunity. He was giving them an opportunity. An opportunity for excellence. An opportunity to grow. An opportunity to be a blessing to the, to the kingdom of Babylon. That's what he was doing. So he had a good intention. An opportunity was created for them in spite of the discouraging circumstances. That's why no matter where you are, as long as you're a child of God, whoever God needs to move on your behalf, he will move them. It doesn't matter where you are. That's why I always tell God's children, be faithful to God. Don't run helter-skelter trying to figure things out and trying to make things work for yourself. If the Bible says the heart of the king is in the hands of God and the Lord will turn it whichever way he wills. Are you working in a place where it seems that nobody likes you? Do you like them? Are you doing your part to invest in their lives? Whether you talk to them or not, are you praying for them? Are you praying for them that the Lord will judge them or remove them from them? Or are you praying that the Lord will bless them? That's important. As you pray for them that God will favor them, God will create opportunities for you. And everyone that needs to move because of your promotion will move. Yeah. If God needs to promote them out of the way, he will promote them. Yes. 
If he needs to give them another job in Washington or Seattle, wherever you give it to them, they will get out of the way for you. Because in this year, the Lord will lift you up. Okay? God always makes a way of escape. The Bible says God causes all things to work for the good of those who love him and to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now, something else to pay attention to. The king gathered. He said, gather to me all the excellent looking young men with wisdom, with knowledge and all that. And then train them for three years. Give them the food that I eat. Now, we don't know much about the food other than that we know that these guys were idol worshippers. They were evil people. So, and then we know that they did not have the, the rules that God gave to Israel. Leviticus 11, what they can eat, what they cannot eat. So, but normally, and when you look at it, the food that and what the king was offering to them was not in itself intrinsically, well, it was not in itself evil or not necessarily evil. Amen. Amen. Because you see, we have the fullness of the revelation of the word of God. And, and the Holy Spirit said through Paul in the New Testament that even, you know, we know there's no such thing as idols. People serve idols in ignorance. And when they say they're offering to that, those who are faith, those who are confident and bold may choose to eat, but your food may be a snack to your brother. So don't eat it. Are you, are you with me? So that means, you know, anything for me, anything I, I take, as long as it's food, I bless it and I, and I give it, eat it to the glory of God. But there are some situations that I will not do that because of who else is there and what else, and what they think, what they think about it and what situation has gone ahead of time. Are you with me so far? Yes, sir. Now, so what we know is this, we don't, we, you know, we know that they, they were idol worshippers. we know the food was not the kind of thing God would order them to do, but there are many reasons why Daniel, his friends could have eaten, there are many reasons why they could have done anything and eaten the food and drank the wine, that really was not an issue, because Jesus Christ also said, you know, whatever you eat, eh? It is not what you eat in that defiles you. He says, whatever you eat, this is where I'm going. He said, whatever you eat goes to the drought. Isn't that what Jesus said? That means you eat it, you discharge it anyway. So it's immaterial. Because what you eat is not what defiles you. Amen. So understand that and stay with me. So there were many reasons for them to have done as the king commanded. There were very many reasons that were justifiable. That they could have used to do. It was just food and drink anyway. And it didn't really matter. Why would they risk their lives. Over food. There was no reason to risk your life over food. Is there? And by the way they were slaves. They were captives in a foreign land. Amen. Amen. And so as a captive. As a slave you do what you're told. And God would not have judged them. I believe God is a just God. Are you with me? Yes sir. God would not have judged them. There were many other people. Nehemiah was a servant of God. Nehemiah was, was a cupbearer to one of the kings of, of the Medes and the Persians. He was a cupbearer. God used him. And a cupbearer, before you give the king the cup to drink, you must first taste it. Amen. Amen. So that if anybody is trying to kill the king, they will kill you first. <laughs> Like the secret service. So you say in today's day and age, Nehemiah was in the king's secret service. He was his own personal bodyguard. So he ate what the king ate. He drank what the king drank. And God used him. So are you with me? Yes, sir. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So there were many reasons why they could have done that. They didn't need to risk their lives. And also another reason you may think of is this. You know, Doing what the king asks of you to do will give you favor before the king, wouldn't it? Yes. If you do what the king asks you to do, you position yourself to be able to win the king's favor. But you know, some people do what the earthly kings and the people around them want them to do, and they forget what the king of kings wants them to do. Amen. Amen. And I pray today you will remember what the king wants you to do. The king that is above all kings. And you know, Another reason that they could have, you know, done anything and done, nobody cares anyway, nobody knows. They were all captives, they were in slavery anyway. Who would have known? And who would have cared? Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you with me so far? Yes, sir. Okay. Opportunities for divine lifting will come. 
they will come. Amen. They came for these people. They were captives in Babylon. They came. The opportunities came. And they will come for you this year. Amen. There will be many opportunities. Amen. And the truth of it is this. Only a select few will enter into it. There will be many opportunities. Only a select few will enter into it. Your friends will determine the extent of the opportunities that God brings your way you enter into. Your friends will limit your experience with God. What do I mean? Your friends will determine the direction and the quality of your life. Remember that. And of course, one more thing, and I'm moving to my point, and I'll be done in a few minutes, is that God is willing and ready to back up anyone who devotes his life to him. Remember we said sometime last year that God takes full responsibility for the life that is fully devoted to him. He does that. And when you yield to him, he backs you up no matter where you are, no matter what the circumstances are. But we're talking about separation this morning. Separation leads to promotion. How many people want promotion from God? How do you get promotion? We said by separation. Separation leads to promotion. When you separate yourself. Now what is separation? There are two parts to separation. There's a God part to separation. And there's the part that you do. There's a part that God plays and there's a part that you play. Two parts to separation. Separation will lead you to promotion. We see a great example in the life of Daniel. They made decisions that they did not really have to. But it was a decision of separation. And because Daniel and his three friends decided to separate themselves to God, God promoted them. What does separation look like? What is separation? On God's part, it is his calling and his purpose for your life. It is his calling and his purpose for your life. He prepares that. He sets that apart. He calls you to a purpose. Paul said, I'm a born servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated in the gospel of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 1. I'm separated by God. He said, but when he pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach, is God begins the work of separation by calling you. By the purpose for which he establishes for your life. There's a purpose for every person present here today. There's a divine purpose for your life. And that divine purpose is the beginning of separation. God acts in eternity to separate you to himself. Are you with me so far? Yes, sir. So that's the first step of separation. The part that God does, he calls you. He calls you to his purpose. He calls you to himself. And then when God calls, he makes provision. He calls you. He calls you to live for him. He calls you, he may call, you know, for some of you, but you have a passion for people, you want to see people healed, and you feel, you know, God, you know, this is the thing you need to do. You want to be a, a medical doctor, or you want to be a nurse, you don't know where the passion came from. And God created in you a desire to see people healed, to see people whole, to see people live well. And that is God's call. That may be God's call for you. Are you with me? Yes, sir. But then when God calls you and gives you a purpose for your life, then he calls you to ministry. Or he calls you to be a leader in one way or the other. Or he calls you to serve in his house in one way or the other. God calls you. Before he does that, he makes provision. So God separating you is calling you and then providing for you. What does that provision mean? It gives you the favor you need. For instance, God had called Daniel. God that brought, allowed Daniel and his friends to go into captivity with the nation of Israel had a plan for them. The thoughts that I have towards you are good. To give you a future and a hope. To bring you to an expected end. Are you with me? Yes, he had a call. He had a purpose. And it wasn't God's intention to leave them alone. It wasn't God's intention to allow them to perish in the wilderness. Or to perish in captivity. God's intention is not that you will be overwhelmed by any circumstance you go through. God's intention is that your life will rise. And your life will blossom. And you will be all it desires for you to be. So he calls and he makes provision. He gives favor, like he gave favor to Daniel. He provides forgiveness. He provides, he manipulates circumstances. He makes all things work for the good of those who love him. 
He manipulates God. God manipulates circumstances. God is a good God. Amen. Amen. That's the God path. That's the part he plays. He calls. He calls you for a good thing. He places a dream in your heart. He gives you a future and a hope. He gives you an aspiration. You know, you see, you wake up in the morning, you just want to be excellent. You just want to be excellent. You, you, you wake up and you just, you, there's this creative, there's this creative ability you have. Maybe it's to write, maybe it's to dream up this in you. And you begin to, to do those things. God birthed those things in you. And I found out that, that the things that God deposits in you always leads you to the destiny that he desires for you to fulfill. Amen. Amen. I call them signposts of destiny. Maybe someday I'll talk about that again. We talked about it like five or six or seven years ago. Amen. 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 Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. So God plays his part. God calls and he provides provision. But then there's a part for me to play. If you open with me to 2 Corinthians, I'm going to read very quickly from chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. God has his part. God always does his part. God never fails. He positions you so that you can fulfill his calling for your life. He places you where you need to be. And sometimes we'll gripe about those things. We don't know that every place where you ask long, the Bible says the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. If you commit, it says, if you commit your way to him, he will guide you. He will lead you in the path you need to go. And where God leads you shall be like the rivers of living waters. Everybody may say, ah, this is a bad place, but for you it will be different. Amen. You may look around and say, what? For you it will be different. Amen. Because the Lord will cause the ground itself to yield its increase to you. Amen. The Lord will cause the land to yield its increase to you. The Lord will cause the people around you to push you into the fullness that like He desires for you. There's a God part, he always plays his part, but there's your part. Second Corinthians chapter 6. I don't have much time, but I want to try to finish as much as I can. Amen. Amen. Verse 6, chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked. I'm just reading this for context. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, verse 17, say with me, therefore. therefore. Let's read it together. Come out from among them and be separate. Says the Lord, do not touch and I will no. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. One more time. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. Says the Lord, do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. Verse 18 says, I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Almighty God. I want to encourage you to spend time reading Daniel. I'm studying the book of Daniel right now. Daniel is a big book. It's a big book. Maybe one of these days will teach you Daniel. But just read chapter 1. Don't get confused with too many things. Read chapter 1 and maybe chapter 2 and 3. Amen. Amen. But what is your part? What is your part? What is your part in separation? First in is this. A commitment. A commitment to God. My first part, the part that belongs to me is... The Bible says that Daniel proposed in his heart. Separation leads to promotion. God said, I will receive you. I will lift you up. I will place you where you need to be. But for God to lift you up, you must first make a commitment to him. A commitment to God. A commitment. I'm not saying to be born again. That's not what I'm talking about. Forget that. You need to be born again. I'm assuming that you've already given your heart to Christ. That's not what I'm talking about. Daniel was serving God. If he was a modern day believer, we'll call him a born again Christian. That's not what I'm talking about. A commitment to God. A purpose of heart to seek the Lord. This commitment begins from the heart. Now, what, when you commit or what you commit your heart to do is what God enables you to become. 
What you commit your heart to do is what God enables you to become. If you commit your heart to be holy, God enables you to become holy. It is what you commit your heart, you purpose your heart to do that God releases the resources to enable you to become. If you forget everything else that I say, don't forget that. Amen. Amen. God provides enablement. The Bible says it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2.13. So the first thing is a commitment and I'll describe what that looks like. And by the way, Daniel is a great description of that. If you choose to live holy, he gives you that. If you choose to live right, if you choose to walk in love, you know what God will do? He will give you the enablement to walk in love. If you commit, you resolve in your heart to walk in That resolve will be tested. The enemy will test that, not God. But then God will enable you to walk the path of that resolution. If you make a commitment to do that, it will empower you to do that. Daniel and his friends made up their minds that they were going to live for the Lord. They allowed nothing to change them or to deter them from their purpose. Are you committed to the Lord? I'm not saying are you born again. There are many people who are born again but they are not committed to the Lord. Their hearts are not committed to the Lord. Are you with me? I'll explain that in a moment. The first sign of being yielded to God is commitment. The second one you know, when you say separation, what does separation mean? What is the part that I need to play? I need to be committed. I need to be disciplined. I need to be, I need to work in self-denial. And I need to, let me round up very quickly. I need to purposefully and prayerfully choose my associations. And I need to see what pleases God. Five things. Commitment to God. Discipline. What is discipline? It's training. Discipline is a training you go through in order to become something or to attain a goal. Discipline speaks of character. But it all begins with the purpose of heart. The question is this. What have you proposed in your heart to do for the Lord? How have you proposed in your heart to live? What are you willing to give up? Self-denial. They didn't need to give up the food. It wouldn't have mattered. Maybe ultimately, God is a merciful God. They were in captivity. But God always honors a sacrifice that is done because you want to rise up higher. My question to you is this. You've been going to church for so long. Some of you have been coming here for so many years. What have you proposed in your heart to do differently for God? How have you made up your mind to work for the Lord? What is the purpose of heart that is different? What about you will make you different from the person on the street that doesn't know Jesus? What is that purpose of heart that you're committing yourself to live by and to walk in? Are you born again? Have you surrendered your heart to the Lord? What does that mean to you? How does that impact your lifestyle? How does that impact your conversation? What are you willing to give up for the sake of what you commit yourself to? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Separation leads to promotion. Do you not know that those who run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. But we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, with, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body. And I bring it into subjection. Lest that when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. Discipline is a necessity for promotion. Self-denial, when you sacrifice your interests and your desires, is a necessity for promotion. When you give up something in order to obtain something of more value, of greater value, that makes a difference in the eyes of God. What are you going to give up to live better, to work with the Lord? Which friend are you going to give up? Which association are you going to give up? Because there are some friendships that we must not have if you want to be promoted. Are you with me? Yes, sir. We must. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Let me round up. I'll come back to this next week as the Lord helps me. What decisions will you make today? What decisions will you make? God will promote you. Amen. God will lift you up. Amen. But promotion will only come 
if you make a decision to separate yourself to the Lord. That means live differently. A purpose of heart. All things are lawful. All things are lawful. As long as they are lawful, it doesn't matter. You can do it and you'll it's okay. But if you want to walk higher with God, you must live by a higher standard. Anybody who wants to rise up with God, you want God to lift you up. If it's man you want to promote, you can do as the kings of the world want you to do, as the people of the world want you to do. That's okay. As long as you're expecting promotion from man, that's okay. But if you desire for God to lift you up, you must live by the standards of God. And the more you say, Lord, I give up so I can experience a lifting of you, the more God gives to you. Like I said, Daniel probably did not need to do that. But he did that because he wanted more. And God gave him more. Do you want God to lift you up? Make a commitment to separate yourself to the Lord. So what decision would you make this morning? Will you make up your mind as to what you would do? What would you do differently? I want us to pray. What would you do differently? How will you be going forward? That text says Daniel made up his mind. He proposed in his mind that he was not going to defile himself with the food. It was just food. But it was significant. He was saying, I separate myself to do what I need to do to please God. You know what God did? In 10 days, God gave proof of what lifting is. In 10 days, they said, okay, give us 10 days. And God validated their decision in 10 days. If you make a commitment to God to say, I will live right, I will live holy. I will do what pleases the Lord. I will cut off what I need to cut off. God will give you the grace you need and then God will validate that decision. Amen. That's what God does. Let us pray. I want you to pray for yourself. Just reflect for a moment and talk to God from your heart. What commitments are you making to the Lord today? What are you going to decide to do? God will play his part. Your part is to be separated to him. It means to make up your mind to do something different for the Lord. To make up your mind to walk holy. To make up your mind to walk in discipline. To make up your mind to give up certain things. You know those things you need to give up. What things stop you from? What relationships? Let me tell you. As you pray, reflect upon that. You cannot be working with God. You cannot expect God to bless you and live a life that is not pleasing to God. Holiness is a must. Righteousness is a gift. But holiness is a commitment you make to do. You must live holy. God says be holy because I'm holy. And I've not come to preach any condemnation. I thank God I didn't see any word of condemnation. I hope nobody feels condemned. If anything, you must feel challenged to walk closer to God. What will you do differently? There are some people you need to tell to stop calling you, to stop texting you, to stop talking to you. Where God needs to get you to, it's, it has nothing to do with them. They are not the answer to your life. They have no part to play in it. And you need to tell them to stop. Some of us, we need to be those people who stop reaching out to other people. You need to walk away from certain things and say, Lord, I make a decision to follow you today. I'm going to do it no matter what it takes, no matter what it costs, at the risk of my life. I don't know what the future holds, but I make up my mind to follow you. I want you to pray like that today. I make up my mind to follow you, Jesus. Please make up your mind today. Make up your mind. And make up your mind that in your body, Jesus will be glorified. In your home, Jesus will be glorified. Make up your mind, whatever it is. I don't know what it is. It might be something else for you. It might be a business relationship for you. It might just be a lifestyle. Today you're up, tomorrow you're down. You have not committed your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. To follow him all the way and you need to do so today. And say, Jesus, I surrender to you. Make up your mind. Are you going to work with God? Or are you still going to be playing around? You want God to promote you? Or you want man to promote you? You want man to, man to recognize you? 
Just pray for yourself this morning. I say, Jesus, I surrender my heart to you. This is my commitment. This is my commitment. Have you made a commitment to the Lord? If you have this morning, lift up your hands and we'll pray together. If you've made a commitment, whatever commitment it is, you say, Lord, help me to do. 